It's time to take command with former NFL tight end Logan Paulson and former Commander's Beat reporter Craig Hoffman. Take Command podcast from Odyssey Sports. What's up? What's happening? I'm Craig Hoffman. He is Logan Paulson. And joining us today for the entire show is Jordan Rodriguez, my friend and host of The Play Callers, a new five-part series from The Athletic that explores the evolution of modern NFL offense and the men who helped create it. Jordan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Um, stoked to be on, stoked to dive into it. Some of, even if, if this conversation is as great as our off-camera, uh, <laughs> non-recording conversation, uh, this is going to be great. So I'm stoked, guys. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I'm going to give you a choice here because I would like to share with you <laughs> my fuller thoughts on what I think of this series. And I, I know you well enough to know that you're going to get emotional. So do you want me to do that <laughs> now or at the end? Um, I'm going to start sinking in my chair. You just do, you do host things, Craig, but I'm okay. probably going to start sinking in my chair. As you okay. Talk. <laughs> so as Jordan disappears for those watching on YouTube, um, I want people to understand as someone who is in this business, like this thing is a masterpiece and to do something like this, you need to me three elite skill sets that are incredibly rare to have one of, um, first you need an extremely high level of subject matter expertise. And you can't do this series if you don't know football on an extremely high level. And you have that. And I hope people realize that as they listen, because you actually work it in so ridiculously seamlessly that you can miss that. And that's because the second one is you are an exceptional writer. And this is the one I'm mad at you about, because I've, I've been reading your stuff for long enough that I knew you were a great writer, but writing for print and writing for broadcast are very different skill sets. And you're too good at both. And that one, I'm not that I'm not praising you for that one. I'm mad at you for that's not fair. Um, but the third one, and this is the one that's going to make you blush and or cry. Um, <laughs> your Great. empathy is, is off the charts. And I've known that since the first time I ever talked to you in depth and your ability to look at the characters in this story and see that not only are they, you know, brilliant tacticians, but you see them as complete whole human beings. And what I think is beautiful about this series is that you see how that human side affects the football. And that to me is remarkable. And that's what make this, makes this series special and exceptional. And that's because you were the one who did it. And it's so <laughs> well done. And I, I know you've gotten a lot of praise for it, but you deserve it. And uh, the work deserves it. Well, geez, Craig. <laughs> I just, I, I rarely consume things where I'm like, that's just, yeah. that's this good. And I, you deserve to hear that. So. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Now, it was, now we're going to spend 40 minutes asking you questions about it. Yeah. And I love that. I'm, I'm excited to, to dive into it. And uh, thank you for, for saying those things. First and foremost, one thing I want to start off with in talking about the play callers, um, which you can find over at the athletic at five episodes, I would love to hear about people. I love hearing about people binging it. That's been really cool and very new for me. Um, you know, it first, first and foremost difference between sympathy and empathy, right? Like, mm -hmm we want to understand why people are the way that they are without pitying them, you know, coaches making millions of dollars doing the thing that they've always dreamed about doing. Like, that's great. But there's also this sort of torture that comes into the thing that they do. Um, and that quest for for public perfection in a game that like wants to be cruel to you at every turn, whether it's coach or player. Um, and the other thing is, this, the, what really comes through in this series is this sense of all these guys had access to ideas, whether it was via Kyle Shanahan or whether it was Kyle Shanahan himself. And what I wanted to do with this series is um, help people feel like they were in the room, not excluded from the room, um, help people feel like no matter their level of expertise, they were understanding what was being talked about and, and what was being discussed. And, I, and so I appreciate you saying this stuff about the writing, uh, because that's that was that was hard because I want to get real techie, right? Like I want to, I want to geek out and, and, but then that automatically excludes people who want to genuinely want to learn and are curious about understanding why things happen, but don't necessarily have, you know, the top level of expertise or haven't been exposed to these ideas. And so I appreciate you saying those things. That means a lot to me really, because that was what I hoped with the show is this is for everyone. Whether you, if you like football, this is for you. These ideas also are for you. These coaches are talking to me, but they're talking to you because you are with me in the room. And that's what we wanted to make it feel like. 
Yeah, and that definitely comes across. Like it was excellent, you know. And I think the way, like, like Fred said, the way or not Fred, the way um, I hang out with Fred Smoot too I, much. I've like never Greg. been confused for Fred Smoot before just, in my it's life. Just a def- it's just a That's default so- setting. <laughs> but you know, I, do, I have to do uh, you know probably three or four breakdowns a week, kind of talking about simple football concepts and like making it accessible is extremely challenging. And I thought you did just such an eloquent job of like articulating very very high level concepts and very very subtle change. Um, in offenses, uh, in like very few kind of simple words, you know, that's very palatable for a large group of people. So I was super impressed by that. But um, I think, you know, it's funny, like when you listen to it, like I, I came for the football, you know what I mean? But I stayed for the the characters, like the personals, the, the people of the story. And I know all those guys. And some <laughs> of that stuff was was hard to hear for me. You know what I mean? It was challenging, like with, uh, you know, stuff about Sean and his kind of constant hunger for excellence and you know, like the maturity of, uh, you know, McDaniels, I thought was fascinating, you know, like kind of his evolution. Um, but yeah, I thought you did an excellent job of that. And then like getting them to talk about that stuff, you know, like and that's actually the openly. first question, like official question yeah. I wanted to ask is like, how the hell did you get them to agree to do this? Yeah. So, uh, it took a lot of bothering them. (laughs) Um, I would say, um, yes, this was a year long process. Um, what, what you're listening to is, is a year of, um, persistently asking, can I talk to you about football? Um, but also understanding, you know, some of the no's are coming because they're in the middle of this really arduous thing called, you know, that they do for a living. And so um, a lot of them, a lot of the interviews came together in, in the spring. And what I wanted to do, and I, I treated everyone the same, regardless, I didn't know some of these guys personally. I've studied them, covered them, watched them from afar. And obviously the amount of research that goes into something like this is, is enormous. But I don't know some of these guys or I didn't go into it knowing some of them. And so I I just wanted to treat everyone the same. And I wanted to just say, Hey, this is what I want to talk to you about. Um, literally this, (laughs) you know, I'm not going to come in and, and, um, you know, we're, we're not doing a, uh, you you know, an aggregation piece, or we're not doing a, a tweet about something you said in the interview, or like, let's just sit down and talk about football and and whatever you're comfortable with, however, however open you want to be like, I'm here to listen. Um, and, and I think one of the things that was interesting was there's such a, um, innate curiosity, I think, in, in all of these coaches, because they want to understand the why of things. And so I think they naturally open up more with somebody who's approaching them wanting to know the why. And that's kind of what I found to be universal in, in speaking with all of them. Obviously, I covered Sean McVay for years at this point, so we, he was comfortable already. But talking to some of these other guys who I hadn't covered, who also, by the way, or like, how do I know you're not going to go tell Sean what I said, you know, yeah. like, so, cause there's this competitiveness between all of them. And so I think just continuing and to be persistent in trying to communicate what I was trying to do with this series and really what it, what the, the ethos of it is, is it's preserving a moment in time. This isn't the end all be all of football. There's new ideas that come out, you know, every year and things change. And there's so many people who influence the game. And this is basically a, a macro and micro look at like one series of tree rings on the timeline. But I think it's an important one. I think it no. matters. And I, I communicated that to them too, is, is I think this matters and I think this should be preserved and I'd like to talk to you about it. And it doesn't mean that I wasn't startled by some of the candidness. I mean, you, you know, when you're interviewing and it's audio medium, one of the things that I do in a written medium is it's more of a dialogue. Um, you know, I talk, I, I press people, I challenge them, those types of things. And in this case, when they would say something very, very candid, my reaction is almost to be like, oh, wow, or to say something like, oh, that's great or something, but you just stay silent. And then they kind of started like filling that silence more because, you know, you want to make sure you're communicating because this is how they run their rooms. This is how they teach their players. Um, And so I think approaching it that way and then also with like genuine curiosity about the subject matter, um, you know, I, I, I would be absolutely the pinnacle of, of arrogance to think that I knew everything about, you know, the sport. Yes, I study my ass off, but I want to know how they see it, how they teach it. I want to get inside their brains and look at things through their eyes. And um, it's it just, I was just open about, about that. And, and for some reason, they just, you know, I think it was the right time for them to really start talking about these things. And I think part of it too, and, and you guys know this is like, 
all their stuff's everywhere. Like it, it's not like a lot of this is proprietary or yeah. secret. You can, a lot of this is everywhere. So why not, you know, remind people that you are the expert in talking about this subject. And I think a lot of them were ready to do that as well. Yeah. And I was going to say like, one of the things that stuck out to me is like, obviously I said, like I mentioned, you did a great job of kind of expressing some concepts and some transitions at a super high level and what caused those transitions. But I'm sure there was like very long conversations and how much football like scaffolding, what was in that, you know, to kind of come to those conclusions, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And then like, how long were these conversations? Like, were you talking to Kyle for like two hours? Like, cause I know he could probably spin you up a wormhole of football if you wanted to. So just like how much stuff did you have to leave out? And then like, you know, what was kind of the most interesting stuff you learned? Maybe you don't have to share, but like stuff that maybe wasn't in the podcast. Well, I, I'm yeah. going to tack, I'm going to tack on an, another one to that too, because it was on my list, which is also how much football did you watch in preparation for this yeah. and, and, and yeah. to, to lead to that scaffolding? It's crazy. It, it was, like I said, it's a year and it's every day and it's like, I cover the Rams and I do work on NFL projects for the athletics. So I'm doing that <laughs> and also this, um, and, and you know, obviously I, I don't like, uh, I feel uncomfortable talking about myself in that, you know, look at, look at what I did. You know, I feel very, very awkward. You could see me shrinking again, but like, <laughs> but, but I think, you know, that's what it takes. And then the thing was, is in some of the ways that we had those conversations, these guys, and Logan, you know, this, these guys know immediately if you are prepared or not, 100%. They 100%. like within two seconds, they know. And so that could, that can set the tone of the entire conversation, whether they think you've worked uh, as hard as they think you should have worked to be there or not, that can totally change the dynamic of that conversation. And so for me, it was like, okay, well, I don't know what I'm going to get. I don't know what I'm going to learn from them, but I know I'll be prepared. And it's not just prepared, you know, in terms of the, the knowledge of, of the system, which, you know, it's hours and hours of film, but also like days, weeks of, of reading and, and researching, and then also having other conversations on background with other people around these people, having conversations on background with analysts, having conversations on background with historians, things, things like that, that like, you'll never, will never see the light of day. Um, but always add to that bulk, like that scaffolding, the football scaffolding. I love how you put that. I'm going to steal that. Um, like how, how all of that works because you have to, you have to be ready to meet that moment. And these guys, yeah. that's what they do every single day. And so why would I show up and not res respect their time the way that, you know, that they respect the profession? If, if you show that you want to meet that moment in the right way, the way that they would meet the moment, I think that immediately levels the the conversational playing field. Um, you know, we talked to, I, I, I interviewed 20 coaches, whether mm. it was on the record or off the record, including the main four, we have, you know, probably like a hundred hours of audio for sure. a five hour podcast. <laughs> um, and, and I mean, you, was, it comes across like, it's like, it's so comprehensive. Like if, if you're a fan of football, like I'm telling you, it's extremely comprehensive and well done. So it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah. And, and like one of the things that w it was weird being an audio medium because there were so many things I saw that I wanted yeah. to share. Right. So, and, and you've seen it like the Shanahan whiteboard, like, yeah. holy shit. Can I say that? I'm sorry. Yeah. Like, it's, it's all right. Well, it, we'll either bleep it or I'm just got, honestly, I kind of want to just, uh, I kind of just want to put a, a disclaimer at the beginning of the podcast and let's let it rip. Yeah. Nick, tell us yeah. what our bosses will let us do. <laughs> Sorry, Nick. <laughs> um, but but seriously, so but that's the thing is you have to and and you guys know this being around these guys, like you have to be ready right away, right? So I walk in and the the interview, especially with Shanahan, the interview is set up to the point where, you know, myself and Corey Rush, the, the 49ers PR director, walk into the room into the into his office and Kyle is not there. Um because he wants to come in behind you, right? <laughs> so that to like, you know, yeah. set the dynamic of like, you know, like kind of scare you, not scare you, but like he wants to immediately like just whoosh into the room and like set the tone and have you on your heels a little bit. It's very much like how he calls a football game, by the way. 100%. Um, and he, and, and, and that's exactly what happened. And I'm standing there staring at his whiteboard and, and, you know, um, I was like sort of talking aloud to myself about what I was seeing. And I was like, wow, um, this must be what the inside of his brain looks like. And I turn around and he's just like, what's up? 
And I was like, <laughs> oh no. So, <laughs> but then it, it immediately started the dynamic because he had been listening to me talk about what I was seeing to myself. Yeah. And, and immediately the dynamic was, um, let's dive right in and, and talk football for, you know, a couple hours. And it, it just yeah. was, it, it was an incredible to see, to see that, like to, to see how someone's mind works as they're telling you how it works, that those are some of the things that I want, like, I hope made it, you know, into the series and, and wanted to convey those little background details, you know, Matt LaFleur and all the teams that he's studying and, and all of those things, um, just wanted to make sure that those little details made it into the series. Definitely. Um, by the way, we have the thumbs up to just stick the explicit flag on it and keep rolling. So whatever, <laughs> Logan, this is I'm your sorry. dream come true. This is no, my it's dream okay. come true. This is, normally we just have to bleep Logan because he forgets. So this is, uh, <laughs> this is excellent. Solidarity, so, Logan. Yeah, here we are. <laughs>
it's got a cadence to it. Mm -hmm. You just kind of elaborate on that. Well, you can feel sort of the experiences that he's had of mostly what what doesn't work, right? You can feel his life experiences of things that have failed or his own personal failures. And you can see how everything has to have a solution. Every, every uh, problem has to have a solution. And what I talked about with him is, is, you know, I feel, I felt as though um, because crazy things sometimes self-inflicted have happened with him in games, um, he's created layers of, of answers in the multiplicity of what he can do, not just with his running backs and his receivers and making them extensions of the run game, but also what he's now doing with his linemen in ways that, you know, maybe a Sean McVay team is, is simplifying things a little bit more with his, with his linemen and focusing more on the flourish of, of finally having that quarterback who can throw the ball down the field. And so on the converse, you know, when I've talked with Sean McVay about some of this stuff, it's like, you know, he'll admit that he's impulsive and he's had to battle with that part of his own play calling identity. You can see it because he literally goes to a drop back game with a quarterback. You can make trick shots like <laughs> hell. Yeah, man, make the trick shot. <laughs> you know? And but then his run game kind of goes away a little bit. Right. Yeah. And and so and with Mike McDaniel, um, who has been waiting for this opportunity and working behind the scenes for this opportunity, what does he go out and do? He gets like the fastest players in the league. Yeah. Right? Quote unquote and in, the, in, in the podcast, our receivers are fast as shit. There you go, Craig. We got gotcha. yeah. you. <laughs> FCC, but, this is a podcast, not the radio show. I can finally also, be unleashed. But also like, but then, but then there's a, there's an identity too. And, in, in how he's talk, how we hear him talking to Tua, he mm. makes him feel seen. He makes him feel yeah. valued in a, in a place where it's a great he, point. he comes in and it's the scheme, the scheme, the scheme. Well, Mike McDaniel was a part of that conversation for under Kyle Shanahan four years. Mm. So what does he go and do? I mean, obviously, you know, not even getting into the the injury stuff, which which really stunk and was was awful to watch last year. But like in terms of how he interacted with Tua, you know, onboarding him into the system um, and interacted with him when you could hear him in the headset on the sideline, making the quarterback feel like he matters in a, th- in a scheme that's telling you it's not about you. It's about the skill players because of Mike McDaniel's own experience within that scheme, building that scheme. Um, to me, that's, that's fascinating. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned Mike, cause I thought one of the things that came out of there that was like really fascinating is he's a guy that, you know, I remember walking to his office in San Francisco and he's got the blanket over him. The AC's on, all the lights are off and he's, you know, fast forwarding, rewinding a motion to see how far the linebacker is going to move and be like, if we do this out of this formation and then for him on the pot on the, on the podcast to be like, you know, it's, it's egotistical for me as a play caller to think I'm running the show was, I, I don't know. I just was not expecting that from him, you know, cause like he's a guy that's so meticulous and like, were there anything that surprised you in those conversations? You said that's a total departure from what I thought or expected the answer to be. Well, I didn't, quite know what to expect with Mike McDaniel in general. <laughs> um, that so, feels like and the I correct think, expectation. Is it yeah, no expectation I, I went in all. with zero assumptions. <laughs> I'll just say that. Um, but, but honestly, like what was startling and to your point, it was, it was startling in a good way to hear a, such a, a young head coach, not young age wise, but he was just leaving his first year as a, as an NFL head coach, his dream to be so open about how he thinks about play calling, how he thinks about football, how he designs things, where he comes up with his ideas, different like he, the 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 San Diego the, the Matt Breida example that he has, where he literally designs an explosive run based off of some scouting that he did over a running back, you know, and it was like yeah. it came to him when he was like lying awake at night, you know what I mean? Like it yeah. just and the way that the layers all unfolded with that. And for me, I was like, usually when you talk to first or second year or even you know fourth or fifth year head coaches, they're still finding their footing in in how they communicate and express themselves and they're still finding their footing in like the, that space of how much do you divulge and and not in a way that you want to sound smart or you want to sound a certain way. It was so natural that he just talked about all Mm. of this stuff, understanding that people were going to hear it. But at the same time, you know, it it just, it, it was almost like, you know, I'm on to the next ideas already. So I don't really care if you hear about the old ones. And that was really interesting to me. That's cool. Yeah. Actually, that that goes to one of the quotes that I thought was most interesting in the piece uh, or in the in the in the series, which is I think it's Kyle in episode one says we're not successful because we're good. We're successful because we're ahead. 
And I'm curious for both of you, Logan, as someone who played in the league for 10 years, most of it under these coaches and Jordan, for you talking to them, but also just in your experience covering it, like how true is that? How true is, oh, we're just ahead versus like, no, this is a really good idea that actually puts the defense in a conflict that is going to be like, unless you're a hundred percent looking for this thing, which is hard to do because the whole playbook is available and any given down and distance situation, or at least parts of it is going to be really hard to be prepared for. Also, can I just say, um, Logan, I need a like long break from all of these people after just a year. I don't know how you did it, man. <laughs> so, so. Well, I'll, I'll they say, they I'll paid say, him well. No, I'll say this. Like, um, so like everyone, this is like a little bit of a personal anecdote about this mm-hmm. specifically, right? So you don't know me very well, but I am very, very meticulous and obsessive about stuff, right? And so... I actually like my personality fit the way that they coached really, really well. And so people say, Oh, Logan, why don't you coach? You know, what, 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 what prevented you from doing that? And I think part of it was like seeing the direction my life would have to go. And, Cause like, that's the standard of excellence that they set. And like, I just didn't have the, I didn't know if I could do that. If I could sacrifice the way that they've sacrificed, which you talked about a little bit in the piece, you know, like that, Like, you know, so it's, we're very similar. Let let me just say that we're very similar in terms of mindset. Like when I was playing your value as a human being to me, as a teammate was directly correlated to how you approached and saw football and Kyle was that way. And Sean was that way. And I think that's why we, we got along pretty good, you know? Mm -hmm. So thank you for sharing that. (laughs) But it's a, it's a lot though, man. That's a big, uh, it's a big lift. I'll say. So Greg, you added, <laughs> yeah. you added a head thing. I'm sorry. I cut you. Yeah. Off. So, uh, you know, good versus ahead. Like where do, how, how true is, is Kyle's mantra that being ahead is the most important thing? Is this a me question or a for, for either one of oh. you? <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, it, most of this is about controlling space, right. Um, and manipulating space and, uh, Cody Alexander has a great quote in their spatial Darwinism, which yeah. I love. Uh, yeah. I told him, I was like, you better copyright that before the series comes out. Cause it's so good. You're gonna have coaches all over the place stealing that thing. Um, but, but it really is, it's, it's the evolution of how to manipulate mathematical advantages in terms of, you know, portions of the field, voids and angles, things like that. And I think staying ahead from Kyle means staying ahead of obviously of the defenses and staying ahead of how they think about how they're going to react to the space that you manipulate. So it's almost a a double, double move. And, And you hear all the time players talking about how he sequences things and how he'll call, um, not, there's never a right word for it, but he'll kind of waste plays sometimes, um, because it, it's testing a void or it's testing a certain reaction from the defense and it will tell him where he needs to go next, depending on, you know, what that reaction is, even if the play is a dead play or a blown play, as long as it's not a turnover or whatever, usually you can find the answer for that. And that's what I think makes a lot of these guys unique. Sean McVay sequences plays a lot of times like that. Um, Rams fans, it's funny for years, they've been so upset by the, the draw play on third and medium. And one time it worked, Todd Gurley, like broke a hole wide open, scored a touchdown, explosive run, eight, like 80 yards or something on third and like 16. But like one time it worked and every, every other time he'll, he'll run this freaking draw on third and medium and it drives people crazy. And I get it, but also it's like, uh, reset, it's a reset button. It's like blowing on the cartridge, right? Like, because that sequence didn't work, right? So now you reset and you start another sequence. And it's important when I, when I think about these guys talking about staying ahead, I mostly think about like how they w- sequence things together and how they test that space. Um, and I, and I do think that, yeah, that part's important, but it's like how you perceive what it means to stay ahead, um, is equally as important probably. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's it's like everyone thinks ahead is like, oh, they're doing something super innovative offensively. And they are. They're doing innovative stuff. But it's also like their understanding of defense. Like when I was with Kyle, when I was with Sean, like they could have installed the opposing team's defense for you. And so like that, like those reactions that they're cultivating through play design, through spacing, through motions, through even like how they coach the offensive line on certain play actions is the thing that's really different, right? It's the thing that kind of allows them to know it's like a boxer studying his opponent saying oh every time i throw the jab he faints away and you'll see in a fight like a boxer will throw a jab just to ensure that they have that reaction 
And like, so Kyle, like to me, they're, they're not throwaway plays, they're mm-hmm. insurance plays. Right. Ooh, and good. Um, that's a good yeah. way to, yeah. I was looking for the right word. That's yeah. Good. So like, he's just saying like, Hey, like, you know, for example, we had a play action uh, when I was here in 12, I don't think he even runs this play anymore. It was uh 15 split and the play action off of it was excellent, you know? And, but he was like, I want to make sure that the linebacker and the safety are going to react the way I want. And so I'm going to call 15 split and everyone's like, Oh, here's a three yard run. Great. Next series, we got a touchdown to Aldrick Robinson because they did exactly what he thought he was going to do. And it was just kind of like ensuring that all that film study, all that prep didn't waste the knockout punch and the knockout punch lands when you needed to land. So to me, it's the sequencing is great, but it's the, 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 the secret sauce is in from a football innovation standpoint, it's understanding defenses, understanding where defense is going. And I think you alluded to this beautifully is constantly challenging convention. And that's mm-hmm. where they are. This group of coaches is very special. Yeah, that Andrew Whitworth says this thing. I've never heard anyone say this before until doing research for this series. And it sort of like defines all of all of these guys and their process in, in some ways where he says, um, we 17, 18 Rams, like we literally wanted you to play your perfect defense. If you played your perfect yeah. defense, we had you. And and that is such an a loaded, interesting comment to make because it's true it's it's the insurance plays and again like if if you can force an opponent to react and show you their work then you can counter their work with your own and that that's so that's so interesting to me but it also what what i think was a catalytic shift and and like just just what you just alluded to was all of a sudden they're now saying okay well i'm tired of doing this 17 times 16 times a year I'm going to bring it into my own building, yeah. something that gives me absolute fits. I'm going to bring it into my own building and workshop against it over and over and over again, um, because now I'm I'm getting more answers and I'm trying more things, but nobody else can see it because it's not out in the open for everyone to pull tape from. And and that's what I think when, when you're talking about that innovation and that constantly, that it's sort of like being unafraid to try those things. They're not asking you know, why can't something work? They're asking how they can make it work. And and that's kind of how they see that defensive offensive struggle and like troubleshooting against those defenses. And and that those, you know, in this in their timeline, they've all made one or more decisions that have had enormous consequences, not just on their own yeah. teams, but across the league and the ripple effects that those have in and I and it and for, it's for all these offensive coaches, a lot of those decisions always come back to the defense, yeah. right? And it always comes back to their understanding and their workshopping <clears throat> specifically against those defenses, bringing, bringing the thing that hurts them the most into their own house um, and seeing what they can make of it. I, it just it, it, The whole thing is just endlessly um, interesting in that regard. So we've reached the point where we're going to have to start picking battles in terms of questions because of time. Um, but I would just say, like, I I had a whole section of questions I wanted to ask about, like, guys like Raheem Morris and Brandon Staley and and the impact they've had on this bringing into the building. Instead, I would just tell everyone to go listen to the series. Uh, I think it's episode three focuses on that, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so definitely. That was maybe that my is, favorite episode. It yeah, was it was fantastic. fascinating, oh, fascinating. How... Robert Sala came in and tried to steal the whole show. It was so <laughs> defensive coach, right? It was like Robert yeah. Sala comes in. He's like, oh, those guys get, give you good, good quotes. Like, let me just blow everyone's mind here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, also just the people you got. I mean, from Sala to Raheem Morris to, I mean, all these guys, Staley, like it, it's really good. And, I, and actually, one of the pieces I remember reading from you was the the piece before whatever Staley's first year in LA, like when he goes across town and and kind of the battles between McVeigh and Staley. And I was like, I like this Staley guy. He seems pretty smart. Um, yeah. So that's another one if you want to go back in the the Jordan Rodriguez ar- archives and uh, and check out. Um, here's the last not because I, I want to get to the Washington stuff because obviously, especially for our audience, that is incredibly fascinating. And Logan was there. But the last question I'll ask you non Washington category is this. And it's about the Rams and the team that you've covered now for, you know, basically Sean's entire tenure, which is, is Sean's personality like this double-edged sword of, um, I would say like limiting in terms of its, its longevity, but also mass impact on an immediate level. In other words, like they, you know, you hear the words like generational contender when new executives come in in some places, and that is absolutely not 
what Sean was trying to build in LA. It's like, we are trying to win a Super Bowl. We are trying to win it right now. And now they're dealing with the long-term repercussions for that. How much of that was just a, you know, lack of foresight, even if it came with the Super Bowl trophy versus something that is completely reflective of Sean's personality that will never change about him as long as he is a head coach. I think we're looking and it's not just him. I think it's a generation of younger coaches. I think we're looking at a generation of younger coaches who are, are recognizing that even as the game is moving and changing faster than it ever has, and you can rebuild, you can crash and rebuild teams in you know, a year at this point. Um, and, and there's more information than ever before. Um, you, you are constantly at odds with, um, the foundational elements of being a coach that translate over into long-term skills and understanding of the position and the arc and the ebb and flow of the, of the league itself and that patience. And you're constantly at odds with how fast things move. And I think that's a defining quality that Sean McVay has experienced, dealt with, sort of embodied in many ways is um, that, that uh, anxious uh, Raheem Morris calls it like this anxious curiousness. I call it obsessiveness to like figure out, you know, what comes next, but also understanding that you're just going to have to be patient sometimes and you're going to have to take your lumps sometimes. And just because things move really, really fast for you in one regard, um, then the league doesn't always agree with you on that. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's like navigating, I, I, the, they, they talk in this series about the coaches they admire and, and, Bill Belichick, obviously being one of them, also a common denominator for a lot of them, which is fascinating. Like, raise your hand if you've been personally victimized by Bill Belichick. But like, it, it's <laughs> you know, it's it, it, the way that he can be both patient and aggressive at the same time with how he shape shifts over time. Not just you know how he built his teams or how he's done all of that, but but how he's had that lasting power of um, you know. Things will change. I will change. Stay the course. Um, I think that that's something actually that Kyle has gotten pretty comfortable in, um, and, and he's experienced a lot in his head coaching tenure. I kind of started jokingly referring to him in the series as like the long haul trucker of the group because <laughs> you know a million years, including the hat, because like a million years from now, we're gonna find like you know a fossilized truck and like he'll be in it, you know, <laughs> and like he's going down with the ship, right? And so, um, but I think with Sean understanding like how to navigate that space between um, how fast the game moves and how fast you want to move with it versus the bare and bald fact that football, it's going to try to hurt you and you have to be patient and set these foundation points um, and identity points in order to better navigate when it does speed up really fast so that you can get off the wheel before it crashes. Um, and I think that, and, and jump on to the next one. And I think that that's what we're watching him do, um, in, in real time. And, um, I know that sounds like very, uh, you know, anthropological in describing it, but, but that's what I think he, he battles with and struggles with. And, and I think that, you know, I, I don't think he would have come back if it wasn't for, you know, that he was, Hey, I'm, I'm really wanting to do this and almost resetting, going back to his roots, figuring out what steps he may have missed in an all out sprint. They were so good, so fast and figuring out what steps he may have missed. And once again, it is very interesting because their roster has 40 rookies on it. So it's almost like it's it, it, on the one hand, we can look at it, you know, cynically, whatever, and say like, oh, it's a rebuild, whatever. On the other hand, the way I kind of see it now is like, He's almost forcing himself to revisit those foundation mm. points. He can't not. His offense, once again, looks like where in his team, not just his offense, his team looks like, once again, it looks like him because you can't ignore foundation points when you have 40 rookies on the roster. You have to go back to basics. You have to go back to the beginning. You have to reteach drills for the first time. You have to show people where the dang cafeteria is. You know, it's just like it's – it's, it's so interesting to me looking at it from that perspective. And, and I think though, that he's like fully immersed in that process and in, in maybe a way that, um, he like kind of missed out on the first time and, and not for bad reasons, but he kind of, he kind of missed it the first time. Yeah. All right. Um, let's get to the Washington stuff. Cause we're, we're starting to run short on time. And I, this is to me so fascinating because it's so essential to the ascent of all of these guys, but I'll ask both of you this. Um, what do you think is the most important factor in the ascent of that 2012 team, whether it be schematic human, whatever it is, 
And then what's, and then well, let's start there and then we can get into the falling apart and kind of the trickle down effect of that. Because that to me is like a pretty fascinating part of the series that goes a little untouched because for the, the purpose of what you were doing, it was not the most important thing, but I'm sure there's more to say about it. So what is the biggest factor in them being able to figure out how to ascend that 2012 team to the heights that it, it got to? I'm sure, uh, Logan, you can expand like so much more on this, but, um, conflict, I think was the defining factor and the most important one and conflict in, in its many, many definitions. Um, not just the, the bad one that we think about, but also the one that helps create and helps inspire in many ways. Um, the fact that they were fighting with each other in ways subtle and non-subtle to get calls on Kyle's play sheet um, automatically sets a foundation that is very, very different from most professional or personal friendships that people have in their lives. And I think, but, but, but that also creates a very specific environment that um, is painful and difficult and stressful, but also fosters and cre creates, uh, I think, evolution, um, you know, and kind of, like I said, in series, it has, it has since the dawn of time. And so if you're applying that to a football building, what does it look like? Um, and there was some intentionality from Mike Shanahan to do that. He also was someone who like Kyle doesn't really never really let you know where, where you were at. Um, you had to go, you had to show your work, but you might not ever get a reaction to it. And so that continues to, it's a psychological effect almost where you you're louder and louder and louder and louder about your ideas and what you believe. And then that clashes with other people, collides with other people. And then oh, all of a sudden out of all of that fighting and all of that noise, here comes this, this other idea, obviously combining it with some truly gifted players um, at, at that time is, is such a concoction that um, is, I think is unique and very rare in the NFL's historical arc. And when you're sustaining at that high of a, a, of a level. I mean, it's like that, that vibration is so high and, and so, um, intense, something will shatter. Right. And, and that's kind of to me and when I'm looking at it from someone who wasn't there, you know, that's kind of like what it all felt like to me kind of looking in from, from on the outside. Yeah. I mean, I think that's like probably a good understanding of like the coaching staff and a good representation of what was going on there. But like, I, you know, as a, I guess it's probably the football background, like, I appreciate that. I mean, that's how the players are treated every single day. And that's how the coaches like pressure builds diamonds. And I, and I like that mentality. I like that focus. And I think when you look at that team, it, it's very similar, um, honestly, to like what Kyle's done multiple places he's been. It's like an under talented roster outside of a couple really big names. Like you look at the receivers, like Josh Morgan, Pierre Garçon, before he became like that guy. Like I was a starting tight end on that team. I'm like, I'm not a good football player. You know what I'm saying? Like guys that really <laughs> understood schematically what the emphasis was, did what Kyle wanted to do. And then um, like played really hard and then were able to intellectually handle kind of some of the innovation they were bringing in from the coaching side. And I think the biggest thing, in my opinion, like this is my opinion, like there's probably, you know, talking to different people, get different answers is, is I don't think Robert specifically understood how much the scheme was elevating him you know you mentioned kyle or sean wanting to kind of follow this kind of meteoric rise and ascent and i remember robert saying you know i want to be a pocket passer i want to do stuff like peyton manning does i want to do stuff like tom brady does and he just wasn't there yet you know and then couple that with the injury and then there was a change and kind of how we did some stuff from like a fundamental standpoint in terms of blocking some of the quarterback run stuff for him that eliminated explosive runs. And I think it just made that, like you mentioned this in the piece, like explosive plays, you know, they lead to touchdowns. And so when you take away 50% of your explosive plays via runs and off obviously play action because defenses can play you differently because the runs are less effective. Um, I think it was like this cascading effect and um, you know, it's spatial, like spatial Darwinism, right? I remember being in games and like one of the specific coaching points for Robert was like, don't cut inside on like a grizz or a bear block. And that's where the big slash is, right? Because the safety's in conflict, the linebacker's gonna push wide and try to force it back. And there's a big hole there, but you can't do that. And linebackers got faster and they they, they figured that out and they would just sprint to the sideline and Robert would sprint to the sideline with them and we get a three yard gain. And then you're in second and seven and we weren't equipped to handle that down in and down out. So I think it was, again, kind of a regression of the offense and what made it great. And I think a lot of that has to do with personalities, like player to coach personalities and obviously coach to ownership, I think was another factor there as well. So, 
Yeah, and how those three interplayed um, and, and kind of eventually became two opposing sides, the coaches on one, uh, the quarterback and, and the owner on the other. And that's that's a power dynamic that is difficult to navigate, to say the least. Um, there's a quote in there from Robert where he says, I wish there was someone there to protect me from myself. Mm. And I think that is one that is going to upset a lot of Washington fans, not because they agree with him, but because they look at him as the guy who was all in for week one and you know refused to take himself out of games. And, and you know, obviously there was all the stuff with Dr. Andrews that you, you chronicle in the piece as well. I'm curious now, like removed from it, what your reflections on kind of that injury portion of Robert's story is and how the, the, the other coaches that you talked to for this piece interplay with that. And Logan, also what your recollections were of the LCL injury first, and then the ACL and ultimately the all in for week one in 2013. And what a disaster that turned out to be. Yeah. I'll say from, from my perspective for, for me, I knew that not having been there, uh, it was going to be so complicated of a topic because again, and, and Logan, you said it, like, it depends on who you ask, you know, right. And it, it was it, the whole s- story of those two years, 12 and 13 in Washington. Again, that could be its own series, I think, because it was so complicated. And my, my ultimate goal in presenting the, the, it the way that we did and then also the voices that we did was there was there, the reminder that there is always a duality, right? because you are you are listening to someone who experienced what ended up being sort of a life-changing injury and talk about um, how he felt about that. Um, but you're also hearing Kyle Shanahan's voice and you're hearing him sort of allude to the split between the front office and the coaching staff and the lack of support. He, he says it very quickly, but he says it, you know, the lack of support and, and then the perception of his dad. And he's at that time, he's reading and seeing everything. And, you know, he's a kid, right? And he's, this is like pre Twitter, right? So this is how he's getting his news. He's reading, he's reading about it. And he's, he's seeing this, but he's got a personal tie to the situation, obviously, but then he's trying to not have the personal tie and just make it about football, but then he starts hating football. But but at the same time, an athlete, a player um, is going through something. And also at the same time, an entire team is going through something. And an entire team is watching maybe this thing that they had slip through their fingers. Um, there's there's such a duality there. And, and um, you know, that, that was where we, what we wanted to present because it's very clear, um, that it depends on who you ask. And I'm sure you can attest to that. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, I don't really know, like what to say, I guess I don't want to be putting people out there, putting people under the bus, obviously, cause it was a very complicated time. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's frustrating. I think uh, speaking from personal experience, I remember leaving the 2012 season thinking I'm going to be playing in Washington for 10 years. Like the way this offense is going, the way Robert's playing, like my life will forever be changed, right? And obviously that's not how it went. I think a lot of people, a lot of players on that team felt that way. And, you know, I think it was it was tough hearing Robert talk, you know, because I, I like Robert, like we get along all right. Um, you know, he's got his quirks like anybody else. But I think the thing that I felt was like, um, you know, you need someone to look out for you, no doubt. But also like there should be an element of like personal responsibility, I thought, too. You know, like it's it's that weird kind of juxtaposition with those two things where it's like, yes, you need someone to help you out. But also like I need to be smart for myself. And he was young and like I, I don't really fault him because I felt the pressure that he talked about in that to play and be out there. But um, yeah, it would have been it would have been interesting to get more of a perspective from, you know, Robert's voice is very strong in that section. Just get some uh, some some voice from other people, and I'm sure that they were not very open about that because I, I've talked to people about it, and they know they feel very strongly um, one way or another about it. So I'm sure that, and th- those are also very personal opinions about yeah. that. And um, so that, it's just a tough. It was a tough deal for everybody, and it's really tragic um, for multiple reasons. But um, like that's like when you well, you said something earlier, like football will chew you up, and that's what happened that year for that team. Yeah, and yeah. like you said, that is so personal, right? And, and for me, in, in, in lieu of respecting how hard it, it was and is for people to talk about it, and I can see how hard it is even for you right now to talk yeah, about it. Right. Um, and so for me, it's like I'm not going to narrate over, you know, I, I'm going to sh- say that it's, that it's so complicated and um, 
try to present as much duality as I can, but I'm never going to, as a narrator or a writer of ser the series, insert things that I'm speaking for other people, you know, True. because, because right. it, everybody like, it's so, um, you say the word tragic, like I, I felt that, mm. um, you feel it and it, 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 it is a defining ache, I think in a person's life, um, to have been on those two years of those teams. Um, and, and that's probably as strong as I'll maybe say it is like, I, I know, and I, and I hear, and I heard, I don't know because I don't, didn't live it, but I can hear and feel that it was a defining ache in a lifetime, um, mm -hmm. to be a part of those two teams. Yeah. And I will say as someone who talks and interacts with the fan base every single day, fans that were fans back then, um, they feel that ache as well. Um, and it's different. I think when you're a participant versus someone rooting from the outside, but the emotional investment in the sport and the team is why we all have jobs. And that should also not be understated the, the ache and kind of the tragedy within, within the realm and scope of football that the fan base felt at that time too, having their hopes and dreams of a decade of success ripped away, even if it wouldn't have come with the same decade of paychecks that you would have gotten Logan had that, uh, had that played out the way you thought exiting the building in, in 2012. <laughs> Um, yeah. The series is The Play Callers. It's available on the Athletic Football feed. Jordan, it's so good. Thank you so much for the time and uh, good luck with the rest of the interviews and then, uh, you know, sleeping like one day before training camp. I just want to thank you guys too. Like this was such a great conversation. The perspective is so important and I'm so glad that you shared what you shared. Like it's to me, that's a gift because yes, you guys invited me on here to talk about this thing um, that's out in the world, but like this story never stops. And so for me, I'm already, you know, it just totally alive, like listening to you talk yeah. about your experience. Um, and so that's, that's so valuable. It's so important. It matters. And I just want to thank you guys for that. You're very welcome. And you are welcome back anytime. Thanks for watching this clip of take command. First, why don't you, why don't you like it? It lets other people know that it was good. And then they should watch it too. And Logan, we have a new exclusive home for full episodes. We do. 1067 The Fans YouTube page. Go check it out and please subscribe. Yeah, do, do what Logan said. Do He's it. Very, very smart. <laughs>